All right, thanks everybody for joining us for IBM I Performance Tips, Minimize Downtime and Maximize Resources. Our plan for today is, discuss, is to discuss exactly that, how to minimize downtime and maximize system resources using robot performance management tools that you may already own from help systems, or perhaps, if not, maybe we should talk. Uh, these tools give you access to hundreds of built-in, customizable monitors, graphs, reports, and cleanup tasks, not to mention multifunction dashboards and unique problem determination functionality, but which tool should you use for the job and why? So we're gonna hopefully answer that question for you today. And uh, let's do a quick introduction. My name is Chuck Lasinski, Director of Technical Solutions here at Help Systems. Been a Help Systems employee for 22 years, been working with IBM I and its predecessors since back in 1990. And uh, as you can see in front of you, uh, we've got our counterparts uh, as well, showing off our, our uh, significant to others. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Alex Lazaro. Alex, this is your debut performance, so to speak, in a help systems webinar. Thanks, thanks for uh, joining us today. Tell us what you do for help systems and where you're located. Uh, hi, Chuck. Thanks for, for the welcome. I work with professional services, so I basically uh, do the implementation of uh, our robots and power tech products for customers in Latin America and Europe and sometimes also in the US. And I'm really glad to have joined this company. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Alex. And last but not least, uh, Randy Watson. Randy, who are you standing next to? Yeah, this is. I'm in the living room, right? That's my. That is happens to be my significant other, as you mentioned. Uh, I'm fortunate enough. I am from Boulder, Colorado, as many of you on the phone I've, I've known for years. I've you know looking at the list. It happens to be the fence in my backyard. So that is my backyard on the other side. That's open space, by the way, on the other side of the of the fence there. So, uh, but as Chuck says, I've been doing this since. Uh, 1990 probably um, and you know certainly specializing in performance navigator for those who don't know you know help system uh, purchased or acquired uh, mid-range performance group four years ago Chuck so mm -hmm. it's getting a little long here but I'm still happy to be working here and, and uh, moving the product along and helping customers uh, understand and help their IBM I system and power systems yeah, and we've all learned a lot from Randy uh, over these, uh, not just the past four years, but going back even further than that. So glad to have you on board, Randy. Randy, take us through today's agenda. Yeah, so, you know, as as the uh, title says, what we're going to talk about is, you know, there is, the, the, these are our products are all under the robot brand, and there's, a, there's more of them. There's more products under this brand, but specifically, we're going to talk about you know, dashboards and notification, uh, which Chuck will get into. Uh, Alex will be talking about storage optimization, which is a product called Robot Space. And I'll be covering performance analysis, uh, which is called Performance Navigator. So even though they're individual, quote, name, you know, product names, they're all under the brand, so to speak, of robot. So uh, hopefully we'll go through that. And uh, Chuck, tell us a little bit more detail here. Yeah, so you, you mentioned the robot brand, and for those of you who maybe aren't real familiar with the robot brand, or uh, maybe we haven't uh, gotten into a, a deep dive discussion on how the how the uh, products are, are oriented, we've got six categories of products listed in front of you right now. We're gonna focus on the right-hand side under performance monitoring, robot monitor, robot space, also alerting, you may have robot alert on your system now, and these products do interface with robot alert. And then also capacity and performance analysis. And the differentiator between those two categories is that we have the real-time category and the forensic analysis category. Randy's gonna talk about that uh, forensic uh, component. So Randy, let's talk a little bit about basic performance analysis. So what's all involved? Yeah, yeah so it, I'm sure everybody on the phone is familiar with, you know, uh, you know, performance. Um, 
usually when you you know bring your system up and your application up you know it's sort of one of those things you may not worry about until the phone rings <laughs> and then then you have to think oh my, now what's going to happen so you know performance issues really fall into three categories you know basically runtime you know a job not running as fast response time like you know either it's 5250 or these days it's more of a web type interface response time or you just can't you know get the throughput of the machine right so i can't get enough job to the machine right so we're all familiar with you know the built-in ibm i operating system commands to start doing quote troubleshooting you know, work at job work sysac work uh, system status you can do the go perform uh if you have the performance tools that is a performance tools uh menu uh, by the way performance tools is now a that used to be a a chargeable feature uh it is now part of the ibm i operating system so for anybody on the phone who doesn't have it like if you're at 73 or 74 you could actually go to the entitled software support and download it so that is now included in the operating system uh so that's one way to sort of look at a green screen so you're really that's the green screen interface to the performance data um, and of course, there is IBM uh, Navigator for I, which they keep improving, and and there's a lot of good things in there, like the QSYS2, uh, you know, SQL services that can give you, you know, some information about what's going on. And then there's the PDI, which is part of that, which is the uh, deeper dive into some of these application things, right? So this is something you could do today if you if the phone rings or as the sportsman says, you can sort of stop answering the phone, <laughs> but obviously that's normally not an option right so and historically when there's an issue and you start having to use these built-in commands most people in my experience anyway are going to blame the hardware and it makes sense because it's easy i mean applications are difficult or more certainly more difficult so and, and as it as infrastructure administrators oftentimes we have to go figure out well is it part of the problem or is it not part of the problem right so is it cpu or memory or disk and it could be any and oftentimes you know it's not the whole problem but it could be part of the problem but it's our job to you know try to go figure that out right and if the answer is yes let's say there is a, a hardware bottleneck um it, well how do you address it right what do i do do i add cpu do i add memory do i change the configuration is it a disk problem you know what's going on here right so you got to answer those questions right which is more of a hardware issue and if the answer is no in other words everything's great how do i prove it so oftentimes even though you as the administrator see that hey it's it's hardware's fine you know i have to go show somebody a the application team or management that this is the hardware is as i would say performing as designed in other words it's, it, it's going as fast as it's going to go right so if, if and oftentimes you've heard the expression throw hardware at the problem which sometimes may be the least expensive option, right? Fixing applications could be costly. Like you may have to upgrade to the latest version, which could take you know nine months or you know whatever of testing and so forth. So that 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 is uh, could be an option, right? And if it is an application, what we want to do, let's say, yeah, it is. We, it it would behoove us to help the application people understand what's going on with their application in terms of the resources that they are consuming in other words help the application people know that hey you're doing a bazillion logical ios and maybe you should create a logical or you know those type of things right so as administrators we want to kind of help them distinguish that right uh, and of course if you get into the storage side of things uh you know is is it a is storage getting eaten up is it uh, an asp issue is it temporary storage issue and again you start looking at the other commands like work at job, there's a retrieve disk information command. Uh, are you notified or, you know, how do you address it? You know, like for example, if you see an ODB, if you see your temporary storage growing, you know, what do you do about it, right? And who's doing it, right? How do I identify that? And over the long term, you know, management always wants to have budgeting for additional hardware if needed right so that's where you get into growth rates and so forth right um and as we mentioned a lot of times it's the commands we're using right to manually do that and you know 
certainly you could certainly say, okay, I can see right now what's happening, but you know, that may not answer the question as to this job used to run an hour, now it runs two hours, right? So you have to actually go back in history to try to figure that out. And as I mentioned, there's the go perform and the, and the PDI. So there's a lot of uh, built in operating system tools, but you know, they do take, uh, you know, time and effort and energy and, you know, it, it's a sort of a right now thing. It's not a historical issue. So, uh, but the, there, there are those options. And of course, what we do is have these tools built on top of a lot of the same data potentially. Uh, but hopefully help you answer that question a whole lot faster. Yeah, Randy, I like your point about, you know, in some, in some cases people throw hardware at the issue, at the performance issue, and that may not necessarily be the best thing, right? Correct, correct, yep. You may not get what you what you really need. So we're going to ask you a quick question here. We'll give you about 30 seconds. Uh, so what monitoring tools do you guys have around performance? Do you use Robot Monitor now? Do you use Performance Navigator, Robot Space, Navigator for I or I Doctor? Do you use homegrown tools? Select all that apply. And, uh, you know, usually we see it's a combination for sure. And, uh, and depending on the tool, of course, you will get different functionality, such as when we get to talking about robot space today and it's cleanup functionality, that's a that's another uh, option that you can take advantage of. So let's close this poll and let's share the results. Randy, take us through the results. Can you see the screen? Yes, sir. Yeah. So about you know 12% of you have robot monitor, which is, is great. And uh, about half close is, are using performance navigator. Uh, there's again about the same ratio uh, with robot space, which is great. Uh, vast majority of the people are using navigator for I, which acts, makes perfect sense because obviously it's part of the operating system. You, you get it for free uh, and or eye doctor. Uh, and as Chuck mentioned, each of these tools have their different, I'm going to call it niches or functions. Um, and they all, you know, and again, it, sometimes it's, it's real easy to go to figure out some things. And we'll talk about those differentiations uh, going, as we go through this thing. And then it, uh, some people obviously are using the homegrown tools of the IBM I commands, right? So, and again, the way I'm going to think about this is, uh, Think about how long it takes you to do something using your existing tools. Because in my experience, a lot of people almost value time as nothing, but time is the most precious resource, right? right. So it'd be nice to be able to figure something out in minutes versus hours, right? So that's when I'm talking to upper management, I always mention this time factor because time is not free. And you know, you want to be able to get to the answer as quick as possible. Good point. Good point. So let's let's dive into the first topic: dashboards and notifications. So the the discussion is primarily around robot monitor. You saw robot monitor is part of our uh, performance monitoring uh, toolkit in the robot product line. Been part of the robot product line for about eight years now, and uh, the the robot monitor tool is a highly configurable customizable tool for monitoring both the system and your application. So I like to talk about it as not just a performance monitoring tool, but an application monitoring tool. What does your application need to look like for it to be healthy? So application monitoring is really number one uh, on the list. SQL monitoring, JDBC and ODBC monitoring, those are big uh, today uh, or nowadays. Randy mentioned that. Uh, uh, when we first got started, you know, tip, the, the interfaces now are typically via JDBC type connection. So what we offer here with Robot Monitor is both real-time monitoring and alerting as well as the historical aspect. What's been going on recently that's been affecting your system? Also incorporated into Robot Monitor are a lot of different built-in monitors that you can activate, but over the past eight years, we've added 
VIOS monitoring, VIOS, as well as AIX and Linux, of course. VIOS is an AIX micropartition running on power. Um, and you can also actually embed user-defined SQL statements into our monitor, and we will do the data collection. We will present the data in the GUI. We will send out notification if, for instance, you exceed some sort of threshold. So here's a list of IBMI metrics that are included in Robot Monitor. The built-in monitors listed on the left-hand side are what are installed initially when you start using Robot Monitor, and everything else listed here on the right-hand side is customizable for your workload. Now, also incorporated in this, we have some mimics monitoring. I mentioned the user-defined monitoring. We've got Robot HA monitoring. We've got Power HA monitoring as part of our uh, repertoire for uh, for monitoring your power system. So we monitor both IBMI, Linux, and AIX running on power. The architecture looks like this. Robot Monitor is installed on each one of the partitions, so this is all native monitoring. Okay, there's no external server required except for the external graphical interface, the robotmonitor.exe. And that graphical interface is used then to extract the data from the central robot monitor host system where the data is stored. One of the questions we get is, you know, how it seems like you're collecting a lot of data. We actually collect most of our data every 30 seconds. And uh, so, you know, that could be a lot of data. How do you, how do you keep it uh, compact? Well, we have purge routines, of course, and likewise, we store the data using variable length fields in DB2 on IBMI, so we store it very efficiently. So as the data is collected and analyzed on the systems, we then compare it to thresholds that can then send out notification to a message queue, we can send out notification directly to robot alert, we could send out an email or a text, et cetera. But one of the primary purposes behind Robot Monitor is pr to present the data graphically using dashboards. The dashboards, once again, are highly customizable to your needs, depending on what your need is. Do you need to see what's been going on recently in the last few hours, in the last few weeks, months, or what's, what's going on right now with your environment? That's the purpose of a dashboard, and you can see if, if you're incorporating a lot of different metrics on a lot of different systems into your dashboards, um, it can take up a lot of space. So we offer the ability to create what's called a dashboard slideshow, a rotating dashboard slideshow. So you'll see multiple dashboards rotating by over time. Okay. The next topic that we're gonna get into in the live demo is the drill down capability of Robot Monitor. So not only does it provide you with a pretty picture, but when you get notification, something like this, my CPU usage for JDBC uh, has hit some threshold. All right, I've gotten alerted to that. Maybe it came in via text. So what I can do is I can go into the Robot Monitor graphical interface and I can look at that particular metric, CPU for JDBC, if I have that configured. And you can see we've got a nice little spike here. I can drill down on that and I can see exactly what was running at that point in time. Because not only are we collecting the performance information, but we're also collecting the top consumers, the jobs that are consuming the most CPU, the most disk IO, um, most CPU due to, due to SQL, worst response time, and, and, and so forth. So we're collecting those lists of jobs so you can go back to find out exactly what was going on. And if the job is still active, you can drill down into that job and if it has an SQL uh, workload associated with it, you can look at that. So if you've got a JDBC connection coming in and it's hammering your system with some poorly written SQL, you can find out exactly what that is and you can see where it's coming from. So we'll supply you with the uh, IP address as well. All right, so let's take a look at the live product. All right, so this is the Robot Monitor graphical interface 
And uh, what you have in front of you is a dashboard that I created called production. It's got my three production systems, my Academy, Guinevere, and Wisdom systems listed, and multiple metrics. So I call these three systems, I group these three systems into what I call my my production systems. So I can create graphs and reports and dashboards around this group of systems, or I can create dashboards around uh, a single system, all right? So I've got multiple metrics showing exactly what's going on at this time, and the color codes are, are based on the thresholds we have associated with those particular metrics. So I'm presenting real-time information in these vertical bars, comparing systems together. I have a gauge showing my CPU utilization for my two critical systems, Academy and Guinevere. And then I'm presenting data a little bit different here for my subsystem status. My subsystem status is in the graphical display. I'd rather have that displayed more in a textual format. And obviously, if uh, we've got something color-coded in red, that that uh, subsystem isn't active, but right through the dashboard, I could start the subsystem. Likewise, there's a couple other dashboard widgets that we can provide. So here's my current thresholds across my entire production environment. Everything that's bad, whether it's, for instance, uh, too many uh, spool files in an out queue, records in a physical file, uh, I'm uh, attempting to uh, ping, an IP address, no response, and so forth. So I'm getting this list. I can also get that information then emailed out to me. And then likewise over here on the right-hand side, these are my high CPU jobs. You can see, hey, I'm out there uh, using a little bit of CPU. Other ways that we can uh, present this data, uh, let's take a look at this one. All right, so now what we're doing is we're presenting for one system, six different bar graphs showing CPU usage, auxiliary storage, CPU for QBatch. You can see we had a little spike here in QBatch. Uh, disk IO, temporary storage, and then CPU for QZDASO init, so my JDBC connections. All right, so behind the scenes, I'm gonna trigger some additional workloads while we look at um, a couple other dashboards. So here's another way to present data. So I've got gauges on the right hand side showing the status of my um, ABLE and ELBA systems in terms of CPU auxiliary storage and uh, CPU for the uh, robot HA subsystem. I can tell what jobs and job queues are active and released, etc. And then lower left hand corner you can see that my uh, power HA systems are up and running all right all right so back to my uh, production dashboard you can see well we've got a little bit of an issue here my JDBC CPU utilization has gone up it's hitting my Academy system so we've got a couple of ways that we could uh, we could drill into this I could simply drill into the dashboard I also have a system view that I can drill into with even more metrics all right, and uh, right here it says my JDBC CPU utilization has gone a little crazy. All right, and basically what I've done behind the scenes is I'm running a SQL script. All right, and I've drilled into the job information, showing me what it is, the IP address. I can take action on the job from the graphical interface. I could drill into the job log. Okay, so that's all part of the drill down. And then likewise, because I do have thresholds and notification associated with this, I should have in my robot alert inbox an email. All right, so when I ran this script and I knew it was gonna hammer the system, of course, uh, I did have a threshold set up in robot monitor specifically for CPU usage for my QZDASO and that's, and I did get notified. So rather than somebody calling me, I'm trying to be you know, proactive as possible. So I've got quite a few dashboards uh, configured here. I can set up what's called a dashboard slideshow. So I've selected four dashboards that I wanna have rotating by 
as as time goes by. So I can just glance at the interface and it will tell me what is the health of my system. All right, so I've just turned on the dashboard slideshow. My production dashboard shows up first and then my storage dashboard showing me storage across my entire environment. So at a glance, I can see, well, these two partitions are starting to get a little bit high. I can see the status of my replication, robot HA and power HA. You might have mimics involved. And then likewise, my critical system and the uh, uh, six line graphs. So this is a way to do some analysis and monitoring of what's happening to your system and this would be considered more real time, all right? So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna move on to storage optimization using my favorite tool for storage optimization in the robot product line, uh, Robot Space. So I'm gonna turn things over to Alex. Okay, thanks, Jack. Yeah. Okay, right. <laughs> Uh, well, Robot Space job is to be on the background collecting these uh, statistics on what we call storage collections over the time at the object level, and it also assists you to find what is weight in space. It monitors the ASP usage, the job level temporary storage, QTEMP, and the fuel uh, spool file storage. It can produce email alerts uh, using Robot Alert, and these alerts can be sent um to the recipients that you choose before you actually end up having a problem for example uh, an object that's growing over a threshold and uh, it also provides graphical and report based trending of statistics and it can fix problem uh, problems automatically helping you to quickly find out why does the usage spike happen and uh, by to do that you need to uh, use the storage audits. Um, next slide, please. Okay, and, and here we have the storage collections. They are basically a snapshot of your ASP at the point in time. They run schedule from robot schedule or native, and they are a great tool to determine what change on your system in between those collections. You can define and schedule the collections based on the information that you need to collect, collect of the libraries, objects, IQ, uh, outqueues, and IFS, uh, the detail level that you want to have, and how will you be comparing these collections. Uh, these are, in, for example, the summary storage collections. They gather information on libraries, on offsets, on new offsets, outqueues, and IFS directories. And now on the next slide, we will see the detailed story collections that in addition of the information that we got before, they gather information members, new members, IFS files, and threshold events. And as we mentioned before, the thresholds, they can, they can be triggered by an object size being over a limit, a growth being above a percentage, a maximum number of records, uh, on or an object uh, existing after a date. These thre thresholds can fire up an email alert uh, using robot alert, or they can trigger a reactive job on, jobs on the, sorry, on the robot schedule. These thresholds are assigned to each collection when you define the filters for a collection. And on the storage explorer, we can see all of our on the sorry on the collection explorer, we can see uh, all of our collections, and we can use it to compare the size uh, of objects between two collections. Um, here we are seeing the history size history of the of this collection, and we are seeing that there was a spike. Uh, something unusual happened on September first. And we are seeing also the threshold for that date. So if we go to the uh, Collection Explorer, we can select the collection for the date when we saw the spike, and we can 
compare objects with a collection that's previous to that, to that spike, and we will see that between those collections, a big file uh, started showing up. So that's the reason of our spike. Um, that's a, a and that's an easy way of seeing and before and after and after and before image and seeing what what's changed on the system. Now, if we go to the, the automation side, we have the audits for that. The story is basically a set of tasks that you define and they assist you on determining problems or automatically fixing them for you. You can select the objects that will be included, you can schedule them, uh, or you can run them on demand. You can either list uh, the findings or tell them to take action, and they simplify activities that can turn out to be time consuming. As we say, we have a library filter, uh, like you see it there. You can filter by object, out queue. You can set how many days to keep the spool files on, on the out queues. You can have a filter by F IFS or the aging IFS objects. Um, this uh, task, they can be scheduled using the robot schedule or the native schedule, or you can run them when you notice something unusual. They, as I said, they can list the object that meets the criteria or take the appropriate action. For instance, they can delete the spool files other than, let's say, 180 days on the outcues that you choose. You can automatically clean, automatically clean journal receivers, either saved or be careful with this one, not saved. And you can automatically reorganize files after a threshold that you set. And well, lots more. You can see there are lots of available tasks there. Uh, for instance, here uh, we are seeing um, uh, on this scenario, we can see a dusty growing. And it's uh, typically, typically this happens when someone forgets to maintain the receivers of a certain journal receiver that you may be familiar with. And you can see that the dusty keeps growing. Well, in order to address that, Using our audits, uh, we can set up a storage audit, and yeah, and this audit in particular, particular, it uh, if you indicate it, it will delete the saved journal receivers that haven't been used in a number of days. You you get to set up that number of days, and uh, you can actually. Uh, tell it to perform the action, or you can tell the audit to just bring the, rest the results. In this case, you can see that we have about 31 gigabytes that have been used for those uh, receivers, and this audit could clean them up, which is ideal if you're a lazy sysadmin, as, uh -huh. I'm, as myself. Um, but I mean, 30, 31 gigabytes, it, that is, it doesn't sound like a lot, but if you're planning to migrate to the cloud and you don't have a fiber connected directly to, the, to Google or to Azure or to Amazon or to whomever, uh, those 30 gigabytes over a 50 megabyte collections will take you two hours. And so one, once you start moving them around uh, on your, inside the, between the regions, and that's how they call them, the, the different data centers, they will start costing you money. So let me show you first. Uh... All right, Alex, you're the presenter. Yeah, okay. Okay. Let me show you first uh, what we saw on the, okay. What we saw on the, on the presentation we can see the collection history and we go to the collection where we had the problem and we select one a couple of days before that and we get to compare, for instance, the libraries. We can do it on creating a report or interactively. I'm gonna choose interactive, interactively. And there we see that it was my library, the one that changed a lot and if I take a look at the objects, again, interactively, 
it will show me this big file that started started showing up on uh, September 1st. So this is a way to know, to understand what changed on your storage. I mean, this is uh, something that's easy to see, but there are some other things that are not that easy to see and you can uh, see them here on the Collection Explorer. Yeah, and you know, like, uh, like Randy yep. explained, the the time that you just saved to identify oh, yeah. what has grown, uh, that, that, that took literally seconds. Yeah. I mean, comparing this, it, it's uh, painless. It, it's done in seconds. And you don't need to do a retrieve disk information or print disk information and start looking or doing sequels. I mean, it's just clicking a couple of buttons. And uh, if we go, if I'm going to show you the collection, the storage audits, I have this on another system. And as you can see, this is the GUI. It runs on a on a, on a PC. And that's the client. The, the rest of the of the application it runs natively. So <clears throat> if you're going to see the audits, I have this one, which is the one that I set up to delete the a new uh, not to delete but to print the information on the saved journal receivers that haven't been used, the HIFS objects, and the H output queues. Let's take a look at this. So basically, I'm including all the libraries, all the objects, all the out queues. You, you could actually include only the out queues that you believe that they're not important, and then it will only delete the spool files that you consider that are not important for the company. Um, and for each IFS filter, I entered a couple of directories that I know that I normally uh, use it for my uh, for applying PDFs. So if you go to tasks, here are all the tasks that you can add. I only added these three, but you can delete history, uh, unused history log files. Uh, you can list the damage uh, library objects, uh, list duplicate IFS objects. Um, I like that you one can for reorganize. the unused save files, Alex. Yeah. That's yeah. That's that's really that's a really good one. And uh, you can reorganize file data and re reorganize file data while while active after a, a threshold that that you can decide. So that's one that one's really good. Um, so yeah, you can list uh, damaged objects, um, unused file members, and this one was, uh, oh, I'm not finding it. Well, it was somewhere there. Uh, you can detect the file that's nearing capacity. Right. So that, that's, that's, that's a really good one if you haven't, uh, defined increments for a file or or that. So let's take a look at the reports that this uh, audit produced. And uh, I'm going to audit history. And I'm going to see the spool files that it produced. And this one is for the out queues, basically. So I have tons of out queues. And uh, if I go to the end, it's going to show me uh, how much would I be saving, how much, uh, how many objects are not eligible to be deleted, how much space they use, the total space used by the spool files. And uh, I can do the same and take a look at the report for the saved uh, journal receivers. If I go, let me try to make this bigger. So if I go to the last page, I will see that the size I could be saving is 31 gigabytes. And the last one is my IFS objects. And I haven't deleted 
my latest PDFs. So I have a bunch of them that haven't been used for 260 days and some even more. So those are really candidates for a deletion. So Alex, you took the option to just create the report rather than actually going out there and having it delete the yeah. objects, but that's an option. That's an option, yeah. That's an option. And, clean. Yeah, and, and sometimes when you first uh, set up an audit, you may want to see the results first because you, you can, yeah, <laughs> you, you don't want to be deleting something that you may need. So that's uh, like a best, best practice. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Alex. Good job. No, thank you. Yeah, let's, so, um, Randy, you get to finish up the day with uh, performance analysis and capacity planning. All right. Yeah, thanks, Chuck and Alex. Just real quick, yesterday, Alex, I had a call from a customer who got a call from their users who couldn't log into the machine, period. And that's because they reached oh. the max number of jobs. Oh, yeah. And the yeah. problem was they had hundreds of thousands of profiles, which keeps the job number. That's right. And he had to go into DST mode and it took them two hours before he got the system back up. Yeah. And yeah, so <clears throat> again, and, and you'll see, we'll talk about, you know, the, the difference between reporting and automation and analysis and that kind of thing. And sort of with performance navigator, right? You know, uh, a lot of things like uh, Navigator for Eye or Eye Doctor, certainly you can report on this stuff, but you know, doing the automation and the analysis is, is sort of like the next step uh, in the performance monitoring. So speaking of Performance Navigator, um, you know, as the robot monitor, uh, our job is to sort of monitor the whole power frame. So we certainly cover IBM I and AIX and BIOS and Linux. Um, we also want to give you the power VM view of the world. And what we're talking about there is monitor your, you know, what are your ECs? Are they, you know, your entitled capacity? Is it set properly? Or is your virtual set properly? Or do you have virtual shared pools? Is that set properly and so forth, right? And of course, one of the big things that uh, Performance Navigator's is strength is, and it just gets into the analysis part, is having that historical data, right? And we're talking lots of it years worth of, Potentially, right? And now, what are we going to do with that? Uh, obviously, trending is one of the big options. You know, you have to have a lots of history to do trending. Uh, the minimum statistically is like 90 days uh, in order to have a statistically valid trend. And as I mentioned, we're, our job is really to monitor the infrastructure, right? And so we're talking about hardware, CPU, memory. So we're going to focus on that. However, and we'll get on the other side of it. We also help the application people understand how their applications, what their uh, hardware consumption or resource consumption profile looks like, right? Now, like other products, we do track library and object sizes, but again, Performance Navigator is just gonna report on it, uh, whereas Robot Space obviously would act upon that data, right? Versus us just reporting on it, right? But we do report on it. Uh, and just like Robot Monitor, a lot of people ask about space. We do have a data reduction process. Our our space is, even with years of performance data, probably, uh, we actually have a graph to show people. And it's usually uh, one, maybe 2% of their disk space after years and years and years, right? Now, one of the, three, the, the significant differences of Performance Navigator and some of these other two products is the host code that collects the data is free. So in other words, whether you have a license for your production system and you don't have a license for your test and dev system, our recommendation is to install the host code to collect the data because at some point, you may need to have that for, for example, capacity planning. And it would be nice to have a year's worth of data versus only, you know, 10 days or so forth, right? And you do get some free things. You can do a daily health check, and I'll show you that. Uh, and you can look at your disk and space consumption, so at a high level, right? Uh, so that's, that's more of a, I'm going to say, a comfort feeling to let you know that the collection process is working. Uh, you still may use other tools like 
Navigator for I or you know other tools that to look at your system, but certainly you can still use Performance Navigator to do that. Um, now, the, the big one of the main reasons people purchase a license of Performance Navigator is for management reporting. So, and this is sort of taking all the the graphical stuff that you've seen from any product, like you know whether it's Robot Monitor or Performance Navigator and putting it into some kind of a management format, right? And of course, as I mentioned, we're talking about managing the whole frame. So we're gonna look at this at the LPAR level, at the frame level, and even at the enterprise level. So if you have multiple systems, multiple LPARs, we're gonna put this in a format that, you know, for, for uh, uh, presentation to upper management, right? Uh, and that is all HTML output, by the way. So, if, and I'll show you that here shortly. Um, and again, in order to do this, we have to do a lot of analysis, right, in the in the historical data. And as I talk about in that first slide, you know, is it a hardware problem or is it an application problem, right? So, if it's a, not a hardware problem, we want to be able to help the application people understand the resources consumed by every job and every user. So. We keep a historical record of that, and you'll briefly see that. And as in Robot Monitor, we can see ODBC current users. We can actually look at weight buckets. Uh, if you're familiar with iDoctor, that's one of the main things people use iDoctor for. That data is being collected by collective services dynamically all the time anyway, right? So you can actually, with a few clicks of a button, get the same data that you get potentially out of the iDoctor product, right? And of course, the last thing is capacity planning, which is a whole different other webinar series. Uh, it, it, you know, whether you're doing server consolidation or on-prem or going to the cloud or PEP2, which is power enterprise pools to analysis or virtual shared pool analysis or disk or memory. That is a function that Performance Navigator probably has exclusively. So, and again, this is why we, Business partners and IBM all over the world use Performance Navigator to do that capacity planning function. And of course, when we're doing that, we're using that free data that you collected, right? So that's sort of why you, there's no, the data collection pieces that's free. And just like uh, Chuck mentioned, sort of the high level, right? So we're gonna gather data. So for IBM I, it is the collection services data that we're, we're analyzing. Uh, with AIX and Linux and BIOS, we're, we basically automate the collection of Enmon data. So Enmon is part of AIX. Uh, we ship out the open source version of Enmon for Linux. And obviously it's part of BIOS too, because that's AIX. And then we, again, manage that historical collection. And just like the other products, we do have this Windows uh, interface that is doing all the analysis of it. And so that's where the uh, quote, the virtual, the visualization of all this data is and the analysis the the client does a lot of math because with data itself, the raw data obviously doesn't have that math or that data, for, you know, for example, CPW or RPERF or, uh, Actually, for like for example, in IBM I, you know, you can't get a CPU utilization graph. And of course, one of the things you have to worry about is over time, your configuration changes, right? So you're going from, you're adding cores or subtracting cores, or you're changing from a power nine to a power 10, you know, whatever it is. So your data could change over time. And so the, the graphing and the math has to adjust to all that. And then, as I mentioned before, management reporting and that's a quick example and this is sort of like the html dashboard look and feel uh that most of our customers do and this is a picture of a, a daily health check and i'll show you that during the demo here in a little bit more detail but all the html sort of have the same look and feel and all of this stuff can be automated so generally what happens is you set performance navigator up to generate the reports people like to look at both management and maybe the application people and maybe the administration people. And then if there's questions, as you can see in that daily health check, you'll see we do have guidelines and some of them are red, some of them are yellow. And if it's red, maybe somebody should go look into it, right? And sort of figure out, do we need to do anything or is that okay? And you know, that kind of thing. So 
that gives you a kind of an overview of sort of the flow of how performance navigator works. Hey, Jeff, hey, Randy, in the interest of time, how about we go straight to the live demo and you can show what we're going to show in the slide deck? I think that's perfect. Okay, I'm going to make you the yeah. presenter. Hang on one second. All right. There we go. Hope Beautiful. everybody can see my screen. All right, great. So this is the inter uh, the interface, right? And you can connect to a lot of clients here, right? So. And again, remember we're talking about managing the machine. I happen to be looking at an IBM I. We're gonna kind of focus on that. The green happens to be AIX. If I was connected to Linux, it would be black. So we just sort of color coded so you can just know what the operating system is. But here's an example of a system, and I have you know nine months of data. And again, it's used for trending and or patterns. So you can actually see by looking at here, this is a trend line. So this is a linear regression. You can actually click on it and you can see. Based on the last 247 days, I actually grew at 52%, right? So that's that's historically what you grew at, right? Now, if I wanted to show management, well, what does that mean going to the future? You can extrapolate this data. So I just extrapolated that data. And based on this growth rate, I'm actually going to grow next year at 41%. So people might want to say, well, why is that lower? Well, uh, obviously, we knew what you grew at. And of course, going forward, it's actually going to be a lower number, typically if it's going up, because you know the, it's the amount of change versus you know where you started from and so forth. But this is sort of the things that people, you know, management typically want to look at. Now, you can see this is co uh, percent utilization, but you know when you're talking about managing a frame, oftentimes you may want to look at that by cores. So you know how many cores are allocated because. Oftentimes, that's where uh, I like to say that's where the money is. <laughs> so, because a lot of software obviously is is charged to like IBM I, obviously it's licensed by core, right? So you can do the same metrics, except you can look at it by how many cores you're using and so forth, right? Uh, so this is the the history. Now, when you have history, you could have to zoom in and out, right? And you know, there's several ways to do this, right? Uh, and because things change over time. This is one way you can actually come down here do it this way and you can do it this way. So there's like actually four different ways to zoom in and out. But this is an example of uh, the graphical interface. Now there is a lot of reports here, right? A lot of metrics and depending on, you know, and most of this stuff is used for problem determination. In other words, when you create a report for management, they see something that's out of whack or red or whatever. The admin people will use the tool to go kind of figure out what went on historically, right? Now, mentioning uh, historically, right? So not only do we have the hardware piece of it, so this is how you're going to see if anything significantly changed over, you know, time. Let's say you somebody reported a problem, and they think it's hardware. You can say, well, the disk is the same, the memory is the same, the CPU is the same. So really, in the in the CPU problem, right? So now you're going to get into well, let's look, look at applications. So the first place I like to go through is this monthly summary. So this is a month to date list of every job that's run on the system. Now, it's uh, bringing up this list and you can sort these reports that come up are actually uh, very uh, sortable. So I'm just gonna click that column right there, you can sort it. So you can see this job in the month of August consumed the most CPU milliseconds. Now, while it was running, it doesn't use much CPU, but you can see it runs almost the whole day. There's 86,000 seconds in a day. So you can, and this, you can see this job ran 3,276 times. So this is not a job that starts and runs all the time. This is a job that starts and ends, starts and ends, starts and ends. So now what we're doing is summarizing how many seconds that job ran for the whole month. So you can see we're profiling not only CPU, but we're profiling logical IOs and faulting and the whole thing, right? Now you can actually click on that number and graph it historically. So this is a month to date. So when people call and say, hey, and I give, we get this question asked often, a batch job used to run an hour and that runs two hours. I go right here and see if that fact that's true historically, right? And now this is at a month to date level. We also track this at the, at the interval level. So you give me that job name and we can come over here and you can track that job 
everything below the top four. So this is the analysis part, right? I can go through and say, well, tell me who the top jobs are historically. Tell me who the top subsystems are historically. Everything below here is about any given job. Now this data goes back 90 days by default. And it's drillable, meaning you can get the average for the day and then you can drill down into the time level and figure out when things end and start, right? So there's a lot of data here to help you figure out problems and figure out what happened historically and so forth. But as I mentioned, most people are looking at this you know, power analytics. So everything under here generates HTML. And mostly what we're talking about is things like that daily health check like you saw or the enterprise hardware summary or the uh, hardware summary or the enterprise performance summary. So what I've got is a couple of examples here that uh, you can see in the background. So here is a health check like you saw. Now, all of these health checks, uh, you can see this happens to be a day. This is something you can automatically run every day. Now you can see it exceeded best practice guidelines. So if you were wondering, well, what happened? You can say, well, on average it's 51%, but at some point it got to be 116%. Now you can click here and you can actually see when that happened. That's a whole 24 hour day, right? And you can see when it got to 116, it was, it kind of got there at two o'clock and it kind of got there at 430, right? Now you can go back and so this, that is actually just zooms in so you can actually see that actually happened at 410 is when it reached its peak so we're just sort of zooming in and you can see the same thing work you know uh, cpw space disk and so forth so again this is sort of hardware oriented to say is hardware part of the issue or not so you're kind of monitoring this and, and so forth now the second page kind of gives you what the specs of the machine are so you can kind of understand that uh, another example is the performance overview. So again, this is a much higher level. So what we show you is for the whole month of September, of course, we as part of a month here, these two petitions, what was the average per day? What was the highest day? So you can see the average day for the day that we had was, was 20, but there was one day that was 78. So this workload varies a lot. And these are all hot links. So I can click on it and say that well, that day happened to be on the 7th of September. So you can just kind of click on this. Now, the other thing about this is management report. They want to know the growth rate. And so again, you can click on the growth rate and you can see how we use that extrapolation function to show management, you know, what the growth rate's going to be on any given data. So again, being hardware focused, you can look at CPU and disk and, and uh, uh, memory. So that's, uh some examples again all of it sort of has a look and feel you can brand these reports like put your logo on it and your colors and that kind of thing so and you can see there's a lot of uh management reports there's a lot of like why is my disk growing over time uh, you know historical memory analysis we can do before and after analysis because we have all this history so a, a lot of people say especially after upgrades I upgraded from a power nine to a power 10. I want to compare the up a week before power 10 and a week, I mean, before power 10 and a week after the power 10 and see what the performance differences are, right? Uh, at the show management. So sometimes you use this to see what the differences is of changes. Sometimes you, you know, when you make an application change or a hardware change, you can certainly do that. So you can compare a day versus a day, a week versus a week, a month versus a month. So there's a lot of options in this before and after. And we can do the same thing for jobs because we have all this historical job data. And, you know, again, everything under here is sort of a, is going to generate HTML. Now, not that this is where we're going to do that capacity planning uh, function, uh, which is, like I said, another whole other <laughs> webinar series. But a lot of this is done by services uh, because it can't get complicated. But uh, we have that data and we could use this data to do, you know, in depth has to be playing analysis so check that's a really quick rundown of many of the features or, or functions that we can we can show in performance now all right yeah thanks thanks randy excellent so just a quick recap uh in terms of use cases robot monitor is real-time monitoring live dashboards multi-partition views highly configurable and drill down Performance Navigator gives you that power frame view, management reporting, problem determination, and of course, its unique capacity planning capabilities. 
And then Robot Space gives you the ability to automate system cleanup to do con consistent and continuous monitoring and alerting of storage, including job temporary storage. It gives you the what what's changed, comparative analytics, job storage monitoring, and so forth. And uh, with that, I am going to um, just open up our follow-up polling question if you'd like any additional information on any of these products or maybe some professional services if you already own these products. We also offer a free robot health check. So if you do own any of our robot products, <clears throat> we'd be happy to take a look at them and let you know how you're doing in terms of purging old data, uh, potentially maybe taking advantage of uh, additional features in the product. Um, are you updated? How do you get updated? <clears throat> and so forth. So take uh, just take a moment and uh, make your selection. And in the meantime, we are at the top of the hour. I'm going to bid everybody a good day. And thank you, Randy and Alex, for uh, assisting with today's webinar. hope everybody has a great day. Bye-bye. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye.